The Honorable Member for Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As, as a veteran, I am delighted uh, to be here to speak on behalf of veterans today, and I'm delighted that the Parliamentary Committee produced the unanimous report that we are discussing today. The report, the new Veterans Charter moving forward, charts a common path forward for veterans programming in Canada. <clears throat> it represents an incredibly important and significant achievement, and I am proud to have been able to contribute my insights as a veteran, and I thank members of all three parties for producing such a thorough report. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, what surprises me is that so much of it seems to be forgotten and that what I've been listening to today. So if I may, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take a few moments to confirm some of the basic facts for the rest of this debate. For example, Mr. Speaker, Canadians should know that if one of our men and women in uniform is injured in a line of duty, they are eligible for an upfront disability award worth as much as $301,000 tax-free. Mr. Speaker, tax-free. As well, these same individuals may receive ongoing disability benefits and other supports that can climb to as much as $10,000 per month. It is also important to note that under the new Veterans Charter, ill and injured veterans and still serving members now have access to comprehensive rehabilitation programs. This includes full physical, psychosocial and vocational rehabilitation services, as well as health care benefits and one-on-one -on -one case management services for those who require such help. Mr. Speaker, these are just some of the highlights of the new Veterans Charter that was implemented by our government in 2006 with the unanimous support of Canada's Parliament the year before. It is this comprehensive and modern nature of the new Veterans Charter which convinced the members of this House of Standing Committee on Veterans Affairs to clearly restate support for it. It is the right way to go with veterans programming in Canada. But, Mr. Speaker, the care and support Canada provides to its veterans and their families goes well beyond the new Veterans Charter. For example, more than 100,000 veterans, survivors and caregivers are receiving our help with everything from year-round housekeeping services to the shoveling of their driveways in the winter and the cutting of their grass in the summer. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the list of services available to veterans and their families is astonishingly long. And I've heard some call it cradle-to-grave care that extends from benefits and supports for young families to long-term care and funeral and the burial program. What's more, we've been consistently enhancing these programs. We've been improving the benefits, services and programs that are so essential to the men and women and the families that we serve. Simply put, Mr. Speaker, I believe I can rightly claim that no other government in our modern history has done more to meet the needs of our veterans and their families. In fact, since 2006, we have invested almost $4.7 billion in new funding to enhance our veterans' programming. And while this increased program, uh, funding is significant by itself, it's even more remarkable when you consider the uncertain global economy we've been operating in for well over the last half dozen years. Mr. Speaker, we've been increasing our spending on veterans even as we've been engaged in some of the most difficult belt tightening exercises. Canadians saw that in our 2014 Economic Action Plan. It included, for example, another $108 million over three years to ensure that modern day veterans of modest means have access to a dignified funeral and burial. It also allocated $2.1 million to enhance our delivery of vital services through our online MyVAC account so that veterans and their families can conduct a variety of transactions with Veterans Affairs when it is most convenient for them. Just this past spring, the Minister of Veterans Affairs also announced a $500,000 pilot project to study the use of psychiatric service dogs to, insist in the treatment, uh, to assist rather, in the treatment of veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. Mr. Speaker, our list of accomplishments in support of veterans is not just lengthy, but very wide-ranging. Amongst other things, we currently have legislation before this House to give veterans greater access to good jobs in the federal public service. We want to move qualified veterans to the front of the hiring line when they're released from the Canadian Armed Forces due to service-related injury or illness. And we are also working closely with other employers to do the same. At the same time, we are continuing to recognize and honor all veterans and still serving members for their service and for their sacrifice. 
That's why we held a National Day of Honour on May the 9th, so that all Canadians could express their pride and their gratitude for more than 40,000 men and women who served during the 12-year Afghan mission, and to pay tribute to the 158 brave Canadians who made the ultimate sacrifice for our shared values of freedom, democracy, human rights, the rule of law, and balanced justice. It's why we've also helped approximately 100 Canadian veterans return to France this past June and for international ceremonies to mark the 70th anniversary of D-Day and the Battle of Normandy. And it's why we've launched the World Wars Commemoration Period with ceremonies and events on August 4th and September 10th to mark the 100th anniversary of the First World War and the 75th anniversary of Canada's engagement in the Second World War, respectively. Mr. Speaker, our veterans have contributed so much to our history, and we truly, truly need to know where we've been to understand where we're going. Between now and 2020, we will commemorate the many milestone anniversaries from Canada's extraordinary role in Allied victories of the First and the Second World Wars. This includes a new national tribute we've unveiled for living veterans of the Second World War. Eligible veterans will receive a commemorative lapel pin and personalized certificate of recognition signed by the Prime Minister. In short, Mr. Speaker, we are striking an appropriate balance between commemoration and ensuring that the veterans and their families receive the full support that they deserve. As the Minister of Veterans Affairs has said, there is no better way to recognize and to honor our veteran service and sacrifice and to ensure that they are receiving the benefits and the supports that they have earned. However, Mr. Speaker, our government also readily recognizes that even the best programming needs to evolve if it is to keep pace with the constantly changing needs of those that it was designed to serve. This is a message the committee heard many times and they listened to the testimony of more than four dozen witnesses from all walks of life, from veterans and their various representatives to academics and individual Canadians, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if there is one conclusion that Canadians can take from the report, it should be that our central finding on the effectiveness of the new Veterans Charter. If you will allow me to, Mr. Speaker, I would like to read a paragraph from the report where this is expressed so well, and it states, and I quote, the committee members unanimously agree that the principles of the new Veterans Charter should be upheld and that these principles foster an approach that is well suited to today's veterans. This does not mean that improvements cannot be made. However, the legitimate criticisms of various aspects of the new Veterans Charter should not overshadow the fact that it is a solid foundation on which to help veterans transition to civilian life when a service-related medical condition prevents them from continuing that, their military career. That is what all members of our committee concluded. The new Veterans Charter is a solid foundation. Mr. Speaker, Canadians can be proud of the work that the Committee on Veterans Affairs did. Members of Parliament from all three federal parties rolled up their sleeves to work collaboratively. We invited Canadians from across the country to weigh in. And as the Minister of Veterans Affairs has said, our government supports the spirit and the intent of the vast majority of the Committee's 14 recommendations. He has promised that our government will leave no stone unturned as we find innovative ways to build upon the substantial new funding we've already invested in our veterans programming since 2006. In the short term, we will immediately adopt a number of measures. This means, for example, that we will be improving family access to psychological counseling services and develop a new training program to better assist the caregivers of our injured and our ill veterans. We are going to help families care for their loved ones with the kind of insight and support they need and that they deserve. We are also going to work with our key partners and our key stakeholders to find the right policies and programs to meet the more complex issues and challenges facing veterans and their families. We value the ongoing input and advice of the veterans ombudsman and veterans organizations. And we want to make sure 
that Canada's brave men and women in uniform, past and present, can always count on services and the support they need. Because our government's formal response to the committee's report delivers that today and beyond. And Mr. Speaker, just, you know, when I was on a defence committee and, and we had uh, a study on the care of the ill and injured, a lot of these issues came up at that time too. And, and uh, this is something that, that was, struck me profoundly as a member of that committee, that we have to support our veterans in every possible way we can. Um, times change, wars change, conditions change. And this government is committed to being flexible and ensuring that the needs of our veterans today and tomorrow and beyond are going to be met. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.